July 14th. Um, today we have with us um, Nita Ludwig of the Rock Island County Health Department, Ed Rivers of the Scott County Health Department, and uh, both CEOs of the health systems, um, Bob Erickson of Trinity and Doug Cropper of Genesis. Anita, let's start off with um, the Rock Island County members first. Thank you. Good afternoon. Today, Rock Island County Health Department is reporting 14 new COVID-19 cases, and that brings our total to 1,248 cases since the beginning of the pandemic. 14 people are currently hospitalized in Rock Island County, and deaths remain at 30 for Rock Island County. Um, we do still have the Illinois Department of Public Health temporary testing site for COVID-19, and that is operating through Sunday, July 19th um, at the Quad City Expo Center in downtown Rock Island, 8.30 to 4.30 each day, and they have now done 3,500 tests at that site. In Scott County, the total stands at 1,118. Deaths remain at 10. Thank you, and as Janet mentioned, we are very pleased to have both of our health, local health systems here with us today. They'll be discussing some of the impacts on the healthcare system of the significant increases in the COVID-19 cases in the Quad Cities. So I'd first like to introduce Bob Erickson, President and CEO of Unity Point Health Trinity. Please go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Good afternoon. I apologize. We're having technical difficulties with Zoom, so hopefully you can hear me okay. So I appreciate the time today. I thought I'd just recap a little bit our, our journey and where we're at today is this is a very fluid situation and continues to change and evolve. So if you recall, you know, when we started this um, journey in late March, there was a lot of unknowns and we kind of asked the community support and help to slow the spread, which you did and we're really appreciative. And that bought us some time not only to stock up on things like PPE, but to better understand the disease, which we do. Um, we hit our peak inpatient census in late April. It was about 50. And then we slowly saw the numbers come down to a point where there was about one week uh, in June where we had zero inpatients that were uh, COVID positive. Um, I talked a lot to our staff at that time, and to borrow sort of an old phrase, that that wasn't the end, nor was it even the beginning of the end, but it was the end of the beginning of the first phase of this. And we've talked about sort of the accordion principle um, as COVID sort of um, emerges, um, gets squelled, reemerges, and we know as our communities reopened, we're bound to see an increase in community spread, uh, which is what we have. So as of uh, Three weeks ago, we had zero patients. Two weeks ago, one. Last week, five. We're up to 15 inpatients today, including uh, five in our ICU. Um, the more concerning uh, factor for us is we're seeing a tremendous increase in positive tests in our respiratory clinics. So these are patients that are symptomatic, that are referred to our respiratory clinics. And I would say last weekend, uh, we send out more tests than we ever have since the beginning of this, and we've seen our positivity rate climb again to over 20% of the tests coming back positive. Now, we know from that the disease process is those that are positive, there's a percentage that over the next seven to 10 days are going to be hospitalized, so we're prepared for another surge of hospitalized COVID patients. We've also seen it flip a little bit from, in the very beginning, Rock Island County had many more positives in our clinics and hospitals. Um, and now we're seeing that even out with Scott County outpacing Rock Island. So just to give you an idea of since we started our numbers, uh, we have tested in our clinics, emergency room, hospitals, uh, over 14,000 uh, patients. Uh, that includes screening for procedures. Uh, we've seen just under 1,300 positive tests. Um, and as I said, where we sit today, including the patients under investigation, we have about 20 um, within our hospital. We expect more to come. Um, we've successfully discharged just under 200 patients from the hospital. And unfortunately, we've had um, 19 deaths uh, in our hospital. So those are the numbers in terms of overall, we expect to see continued surge. 
Um, another thing that's changed since the beginning of this, and I know Doug will speak to it as well, our ICU is, is our ICUs are pretty much full with um, non-COVID patients as well. And so as, as we sort of put off elective cases as best we could, we're seeing a phenomenon that our, our hospitals right now are full of really sick people. Maybe people waited too long. Uh, maybe people did not get um, health and, and wellness checks. Maybe the stress of the situation has kind of a comorbid impact in terms of disease state. Uh, but right now we're, we're really stressed from an ICU perspective and are very concerned about the increased COVID numbers coming in because we're starting to see um, population come into med surge and then ICU as well. One other factor is we're seeing younger people test positive, um, which we would expect with sort of the, the social activities. Um, but we're also seeing younger people hospitalized. So uh, our doctors will tell you this is a disease um, of many masks where you can't always predict what it presents like um, except we know that for some people, it, it has significant impact. So we have reactivated our elective procedures. We pretty much caught up with the backload of surgeries, uh, cath procedures, but we know there's tremendous demand in the community that we find a way as a community, not only to treat and, and help mitigate COVID, but to make sure we're taking care of heart attacks and stroke and cancer. Uh, appendicitis, all those things that come in, people with orthopedic problems that have been putting it off, but they're in really debilitating states of pain. We've got to work every day to sort of balance this surge and resurge of COVID um, with the regular things that we need to do in our community. So that's why it's still so important to follow the guidelines put out of, of hand hygiene, wearing a mask, social distancing, if you feel ill, um, we need to get you tested and trace um, where you've been so we, we can work with our health departments to make sure that we're trying to keep, um, keep this under control as much as we can. We're always gonna be there for our communities, but this is a, this is a strange time. This is not over. And we're now seeing um, a, a resurgence of cases as we've seen our communities reopen up. And not just here in the Quad Cities, we're, we're seeing it nationally. So we continue to be in it together. We're in a good place with PPE. Um, we're in a, a pretty good place with understanding uh, some of the disease process that we're, we're seeing some better treatments, uh, but we remain very concerned about um, the continual spread. And most of the spread that we're seeing right now is community spread, community acquired. So what's worrisome about that is the numbers go up if we see another cluster outbreak in nursing homes, in our, in our plants, our food processing plants, it could overwhelm the health system pretty quickly. And we've seen that in some of the other areas within our own system. So just very appreciative of the community effort, um, but now's not a time to let our guard down because we're seeing the impact of this very dangerous uh, disease as it reemerges and now spreads even quicker in our communities. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, next, we'll go on to Doug Cropper, President and CEO of Genesis Health System. Please go ahead, Doug. I'll try not to duplicate what Bob said. Um, I would just echo a lot of his comments. The, the statistics are just a little bit different from Genesis, and maybe I'll share uh, you know, some additional statistics that might be helpful. But like Bob said, you know, we're in our fifth month, and uh, I heard someone else say, we may be done with COVID, but it's not done with us. And that's kind of the attitude we need to take where we're all in it for the long haul. And it's very difficult, right? I mean, we want to go out, we want to go to the restaurants, people want to go to the bars, et cetera. And uh, we're just not in that kind of a situation where we can let our guard down. Because what we've seen happen over the last 30 days, particularly in Scott County, has, uh, has a very negative impact and a potential a ch real challenge for the hospital. So let me just give you some numbers and they'll illustrate some of the points that Bob made. If I compare the first uh, seven days of June with the first seven days of July, the number of symptomatic patients we saw in our physician offices, clinics, urgent cares, emergency departments was about 450 in the first part of June, first seven days of June. It was three times that. 1,334 in the first seven days of July, and it's continued that way. 
we had the same thing that Bob did was very, very low COVID census numbers in June. Um, the one that I watch very carefully is the symptomatic patients that are positive. In June, that number was running at 2% the first seven days for our testing. Um, under 4% or 5% is a good number as far as the CDC is concerned. They get concerned at 10. It's really bad if it gets up to 20. Some of the states in the country and counties in the country are running higher than 20. So we were running at two in June. We're running now more like 11. We had, we had a few days where we were running at 18. That's when we really started to get concerned. And so that is, that is very concerning because a percentage of those patients who are positive then start to have difficult uh, disease issues. They come into the hospital, they come into the ICU, and they fill up our ICUs, which is where we're at right now. Um, it, is, it is getting transmitted uh, at much higher rates among the young people. In March, for instance, we saw the young percentage of people, uh, the percentage of people under 40 at 20%. Uh, that tested positive, now that's running closer to 60%. So um, if you look at the rates, if you just take the first two numbers I shared, the number of symptomatic patients, three times as much now than it was in June. The, the number of positive tests from symptomatic patients, five times as much. The rate that we're seeing now versus what we saw in June is 15 times higher, 15 times higher. And that cascades then and comes right into the hospital. So uh, our hospital census today is 23. In the last seven days, we've been running anywhere from 15 to 25. And that is dramatically higher than it was in June, where like, um, like Bob, Trinity was running zero patients. There were days where we were running very few patients, not quite zero, but very few, less than five. Just yesterday, we did 292 symptomatic COVID patient tests. We don't have those results back because it takes a couple of days to get the results. That's a, that's a huge number of symptomatic patients. That's the most we've seen in the last seven uh, to 14 days. So we're very concerned. Uh, our ICU at GMC Davenport, uh, from a regular capacity standpoint, is essentially full. What happens in the ICU like Bob said, is we have some really, really sick people beyond our COVID patients. So we have eight COVID patients in our GMC Davenport ICU, and we have a whole bunch of other really sick patients. And many of those patients need one-on-one -on -one staffing, which requires a tremendous amount of nursing. So we're having to pull nurses from other areas within the hospital who are ICU and critical care trained to help us care for patients up to our capacity of 26, and that's what we're working on today. We have the bed capacity to open another kind of overflow ICU unit uh, that's an additional 10 beds, but the only way we could do that is if we start uh, stopping elective surgical cases again, and this is something we don't wanna do for the community because many, many of those people waited, and this is what we're trying to avoid, and I know Bob's in a similar situation. So we really need the community's help. We really need help. And what we need people to do is social distance and wear a mask. This has proven to be effective. And this is one reason why Illinois is doing better, I think, than Iowa right now is because Governor Pritzker has been very diligent in opening slower and in requesting mask compliance. And uh, this is having an impact on slowing the rate of COVID transmission within the state of Illinois. So I can't emphasize enough, we do not want to go back to the days of April uh, and May and March when we had to curtail the amount of elective business we were doing within the hospital. We need to find this balance of coexisting with COVID. It's not gonna go anywhere until we get uh, a vaccine that's effective. That's gonna be many months, at least I would say at least six to nine months. And so for that next six to nine months, we have to figure out how to coexist. And uh, when we're running out of ICU beds, this is a, this is a warning sign and this is a, uh, a sign of a problem for the community that we really need your help 
in social distancing and wearing masks so we can slow transmission. Just yesterday, I was in the grocery store. I would guess that uh, seven, the good news is 70% of the people had masks on, but 30% not. Uh, many of those were young people, some of them were older, and they must think they're immune, but that is not the case. All you'd have to do is come into the ICU and see those eight patients that we have who, who are gonna stay two weeks, uh, many, in many cases on a ventilator, on a terrible, with a terrible disease that just ravages your lungs, has all kinds of clotting implications, very, very, very difficult. Um, this is a real thing and we need your help to be able to continue to coexist with this until we can get a, get a vaccine. So help us slow down the, the current transmission rate and we really, uh, we really appreciate the help from the community in order to be able to do that. Thank you, Bob. And um, we would request any of the media, or Doug, I apologize. Um, we would okay. request any of the media on the call to please um, type their questions into the chat and we will get to them as we are able. Um, we'll start, Doug, with you on the first question. How are both hospital systems ready to respond for the second wave of COVID? <laughs> Well, you know, the, uh, Dr. Fauci has talked about this and, and Bob said it, you know, we're at the end of the first wave. So these are just spikes we're seeing within the first wave. If you study the 1918 uh, flu pandemic, it was much, much later that the second wave came. So this is, uh, this is not uh, even the second wave yet. We have, we have worst case scenario plans. Bob and I uh, have collaborated on those um, and those worst case scenario plans allow us to, to care for hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients. But in order to do that, we have to focus all of the hospital resources uh, to be able to do that. And we slow our ability to treat everything else down except for the most serious emergencies. And that is just not where we wanna go as two healthcare providers, nor that's, that's not the place that the community wants us to go. So we've got all those plans, we can pull them off the shelf, we can execute them, they're just not a very good thing. And this is what's happening right now within Texas, Florida, Arizona. And frankly, we want to avoid that, whether it's in, you know, surge one or surge two or whatever. So that's, uh, that's how I would answer it. Yes, uh, well said, Doug. Um, so a couple of things, it, we've never stopped being prepared um, as we know that we're still in this uh, environment and it's not going away but certain things that are a little bit different this time than where we started um, one is access to PPE uh, has gotten much better we have not stopped acquiring nor storing uh, PPE so we can be prepared and ready to keep our staff safe um, and our, our patients safe uh, so we're in a much better spot as that goes um, I would say that uh, we also as, as Doug stated we're looking daily at our staffing to make sure we can balance doing the elective and even um, quasi-elective type of procedures so people don't wait too long for care. Um, and so throughput is really important to our hospitals. So I think we're, we've done a much better job, both Genesis and um, Trinity, in terms of coordinating with our nursing homes, for instance, um, and looking at this from a community perspective on most appropriate places uh, for patients so we can kind of keep our capacity levels at a place where we can handle more patients. Um, and then I'd say that the last component is I, I feel we're in a better spot, at least right now, in terms of testing, although we're in the same spot as Genesis, the number of symptomatic patients coming to our testing spots is more than at any time during this uh, last few months. And so with that nationally it can clog up you know, return um, time on testing and things like that. So I think we understand it much better and we just are playing with a dynamic that now we're focused on, as Doug said, I think really well, trying to coexist with COVID um, without uh, compromising other types of access that we know needs to happen in our community. You know, so, I'll just add something to Bob's point about testing because it's such an important part of this. You know, what's interesting to think about from a medical standpoint is to go from zero tests being able to be done within this country for a brand new disease that we've never seen before to being able to do what we're doing now, which is 700,000 tests a day. Think about that. 
six months later, 700,000 tests a day. That's an amazing accomplishment, but it's still not even enough. And uh, if you look at the statistics around number of tests per day, it's growing almost at a, like a 60% curve from zero up to 700,000. Pretty soon it'll be at a million tests a day. So um, we are in a different situation and I appreciate Bob's answer to that. Just like uh, Trinity Genesis has approaching six months of PPE stockpile in, in all categories. We do not have PPE issues like we did at the beginning, but it's still possible for us to, uh, because of the volume that may come to us from COVID patients and other emergencies, to be able to um, be, uh, to have to refocus these resources. And that's really not what we want to do. You know, on the PPE side, a lot of people ask me questions about PPE. We actually became an owner with uh, 16 other health systems in a PPE company to bring PPE manufacturing back to the United States, which is a great thing long-term. But again, our, our most critical need right now is our desire to continue to care for the community as well as coexist with COVID for the next six to nine months until we can actually get a vaccine. And that's why we need the community's help with masking and with social distancing. So Doug, to follow up to an earlier comment you had, one of the questions here says, how frustrating is it that you still have to spend time trying to convince the public that this is the real thing? <laughs> oh boy, that's interesting. You know, there's a lot of, it's, well, first of all, it's become somewhat of a political issue which is unfortunate because this is a public health care pandemic and crisis. This is not a political situation. And, you know, I read comments or see interviews of people that think that this is a conspiracy. And, you know, I just, I can't even understand that. How do you get every single hospital in the country to buy into some conspiracy? This is, this is no conspiracy. This is a real situation, a new disease that we've never seen before that has the ability to overrun the healthcare systems if, if the community is not being very careful and, uh, and managing it well. Early on, we saw that in New York. Now we're seeing that within Florida, Arizona, and Texas. And this is what Bob and I want. We do not want what is happening in Texas, Florida, and Arizona to happen here. That's why we need people's health. No one is immune. We've seen 30-year-olds die of the massive clotting that can happen with this disease. It's so unusual. Bob, you said it earlier, physicians will tell you this disease wears many different masks. It appears in many different ways. The young people are not immune. Uh, you know, there's unfortunately under 20 year olds that have died. Uh, we've had uh, 30 year olds that have died. It's not just the older people who have lung issues or other chronic diseases. This is a real thing. This is a real thing. No one is immune from getting this. And if you get it, it can be very bad. Well, and then in some of the um, hypotheticals you were mentioning, Bob, we'll go to you for this one. What would the scenario look like if you had to treat hundreds? How would your routines change? So maybe generally speaking, how would you anticipate some of those things as you are seeing in some of the other states? Yeah, so I mean, first and foremost, um, we've worked together as a community of providers with um, all parts of the continuum. I'm sure we would have to, um, you know, uh, suppress other types of volumes again to get all hands on deck for treating COVID patients. As Doug said, these are very resource intensive patients. Um, and so for those that could wait for other type of procedures, we, we would have to suppress it. We would look at, um, you know, uh, bringing in staff from other places, whether it's within our system or uh, elsewhere to make sure we can handle it. And we've got those plans, frankly, in place. The good news is when this all started, the modeling was such um, that it could have been really, really uh, bad from a, a pure volume perspective of COVID. So we've got those contingency plans in place. And we would have to find some type of look at what would trigger them putting those full search plans in place for staffing, equipment, looking at other uh, places of care for other types of services. So that would be step one, is it, if it got to that level, um, we've got the capacity to handle it as a community. 
it's just it would mean other things would have to be delayed and suppressed again, which we don't want because we're seeing the acuity of our patients without COVID is, uh, is, is higher. And that I'm sure correlates to this. I can't tell you it's caused by it, um, but we, we wanna make sure we've got a good balance of being able to take care of those that are sick with COVID as well as people having strokes and heart attack and, and cancer and appendicitis and all that type of stuff. But that would be one response is if it got to that level, um, we would have to sort of repurpose our core services to focus on um, that level of crisis. Anything you would like to add to that, Doug? Um, yeah, just a couple of things. I think one of the things that uh, everybody probably needs to understand is um, there's different resources that need, are needed, needed for different aspects of this disease. And at least the most difficult part of what I'm seeing is uh, what happens within the ICU, the most critical patient. Our ICU patients have an average length of stay of 15 days. A, a heart surgery patient may stay 24 to 48 hours in an ICU and we're talk, and then go down to a step down unit. We're talking about two weeks in the ICU. That's how sick these people are. All it takes is for one new patient to go into the ICU every day for two weeks and your COVID census is 14 in an ICU. That's how quickly these ICUs can get filled up with COVID patients. This is why we're trying to slow the transmission. So we respond to whatever happens. Um, if, it's a, if we saw a surge in hundreds of medical patients, that frankly is a lot easier to deal with than a surge of uh, you know, 50, 50 patients needing ICU level care because the resources you have to direct to be able to deal with ICU patients are much more intensive than the resources on the medical surgical side. So we can do that, and Bob said it well, you pull these resources from slowing down in the elective cases in other areas of the hospital, like cath lab, um, the OR, and you move these nurses over to other places. And he's put those plans together, we put those plans together in detail, and we have the ability to do that. It just doesn't look very good uh, for the community because we have to slow down business that actually needs care. And that's exactly what happened in March, April, and May and we don't want to go back to that because, Bob, you said it, the people that are coming in now are sicker than we would normally see because their care was slowed down for whatever reason, whether we slowed it down or they slowed it down and didn't come in. Our next question here is related to ventilators. And I know there's been a lot of interest in this just in the past couple of months. I think since it's a finite commodity, um, very different than some of your PPE. Um, so we can start again with you, Doug. How many ventilators do you have readily available? And perhaps you can describe sort of um, what that would be on a given day compared to possibly how it is now. Well, we have way more ventilators than we would ever be able to staff uh, from an ICU bed standpoint. Uh, part of the reason for that is, is we ramped up with uh, ventilators when we, we started to ramp up with PPE. We also can convert uh, certain breathing machines to ventilators as well as anesthesia machines. The issue, the issue is not ventilators. We could get 75 to 100 machines operating as ventilators. The, the issue is always going to be the staffing resources on the physician side and the nursing side to be able to staff and care for that many patients in a safe fashion. So the actual equipment is not the problem. And Bob said this, and I mentioned, made this point earlier with PPE as well, whether it's PPE, personal protective equipment, or any kind of equipment, we can't, we can't um, see, we can't foresee any scenario where we would have an equipment or a supply problem. It's really a personnel resource problem that makes it difficult to be able to care for the, the most worst case scenario surge of these kind of patients. I would add to that, you know, and I mentioned we had sort of a, a bit of a gift of time that we're learning. I mean, this isn't a static understanding of COVID. We keep, the science keeps getting better and better in terms of what we learn. One thing we've learned is there's some other efficacious type treatments early on that can keep people off ventilators. 
um, kind of this, this um, high nasal flow oxygen. Um, um, we've got people on other type of devices that are tending to do pretty well. If we can keep them off the vent, um, it looks like patients tend to do better which is good. So I with Doug, we've got um, ventilators is not a concern uh, to me in terms of number. We've got uh, quite a bit, um, you know, that we're not using that are at our disposal. So even with a big surge, um, equipment's not going to be an issue for us. I don't see any additional questions from our media partners on the call. So I'll let you each have a moment if you'd like to do any closing thoughts. So perhaps we can start with you, Bob. Sure, again, just uh, appreciative of all the community effort uh, to get there. Um, and we're gonna get through this together, but again, th this is not over and it's real. As Doug said, if you could spend time in an ICU or in the hospital or in the ER, and uh, there's some real um, sadness with stories and some real tragedy. I'd say there's also some moments that lift your soul that are great when you see patients recovering and fighting and being discharged after 60 days and go home to their family and loved ones. Um, it's a testament to not only the will of the human spirit, but of working together to try to solve a situation we're still learning about. So again, I, I can't um, uh, reaffirm and reiterate enough of what Doug said which is it doesn't mean we have to um, stop living our lives, but we've got to do the right things. Um, and for me, I mean, th this is not a uh, political statement. This is a public health statement um, that we know what works in terms of, of trying to mitigate the spread and, and keep ourselves and our community safe. So I just um, ask um, that we all continue to commit to each other as neighbors and friends and as a community to do the right thing um, so we can all get through this. So thank you. Um, my comments would be just re-emphasizing again uh, that we need to figure out together how to coexist with this disease until we can get an effective vaccine or her herd immunity. I would recognize the community for all they've done so far. To this point, we've done a great job together, I think, uh, dealing with this. We're in a much better situation than the hotspot areas within the United States. And that's a tribute to all the people that have worked so hard to help slow the transmission of the disease. I would just recognize our staff, uh, physicians, nurses, and all the professionals that are caring for these people. It, uh, it's really taxed the healthcare systems and will continue to do so for the next six to nine months. We have to all be in it for the long haul. We have to approach this again for the long term. This is not something that's gonna be of short duration. Like most crises, a tornado comes through, short duration, a hurricane comes through, not here, but somewhere, short duration. In the end, we really need the community's help as we continue to approach this for the long haul. We need to mask up, like Bob said, if we can get 60%, the statistics show, 60% of the people wearing a mask that's 60% effective, which is either a cloth mask, this one's 70% of effective, uh, an ear loop hospital mask. We will slow the transmission and the numbers of cases will go down and we'll be able to manage this at a level that will allow the health system to continue to do what they do best, which is care for the community when they need us. We really don't want to redirect our resources to care for hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients because this has gotten out of control we want to be able to care for those few COVID patients over the next six, nine to months, six to nine months as we continue to care for the community. And that's why we need everybody to mask up and socially distance until we find ourselves in a different situation with this pandemic. So thank you again for all your help and thank you to the media for helping us get the word out because this is a critical turning point for us right now. If we can turn this around to get back to June numbers, rather than July numbers. Thank you both for joining us today and for sharing this valuable insight on the impacts that we're currently seeing in the health systems, as well as your call to action for our community. Um, we're very grateful to have your support in this messaging and as well as you just spoke to the media for sharing these important messages. Um, so we'll continue to be sharing this as well as some of the other impacts that we're seeing in an effort to help um, reduce those cases and get us back to where we were um, just a few short weeks ago.
So thank you all for joining us and we will be in touch, but have a good afternoon. Thank you.